All right. So this is a story of two ancient sacred mountains having the same name with roots and mythology that intertwine with one another, inclusive of their associated goddesses and accompanying spirits. Now, uh, the, the two mountains are called Mount Ida. Uh, and it was called that by the ancient Greeks. And one uh, is located uh, in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today, known as Kats Dagi, a position near the Troad, and also, which is just southeast of Troy, and on the border of ancient Phrygia. And the other is on the island of Crete. Uh, today, it's called uh, Mount Soartus, and it is the highest mountain on the island. Now, the spirits uh, connected with both of the Idas were known as Idaean dactyles, uh, who were very mysterious and magical creatures, uh, considered not only agents of magic, but also of musical notes and metalworking, specifically iron. Um, and they live supposedly along the lower parts of both of the mountains, uh, hence the fact, again, why they're called Idaean. According to the, uh, the famous uh, geographer from the second century, his name is Pausanias, uh, the Idaean dactyles protected baby Zeus from the devouring father Kronos after Rhea gave birth to him below Mount Ida on Crete. Uh, the Mount Ida in Asia Minor was connected to the great mother Adrastia, uh, who in turn was also closely related to the goddess Rhea, as well as the Phrygian goddess Kibli. Uh, so you can see a connection already. So therefore, the goddess Rhea then is associated with both the mountains on Crete and in the Troad, with a legacy uh, that, that can be traced back all the way uh, to the Minoans. Now, according to Strabo, uh, from the first century BCE into the first century CE, both uh, those known as the Curates and the Coribantes were understood as offsprings from the Idean dactyles, uh, who again originated from Mount Ida uh, in the Troad, uh, as well as in Crete. It's fascinating how you're going to have uh, this parallel, uh, these parallel mythologies and stories of these two mountains in two different locations, both na named as Ida. And of course, you have this cross section of different ideas kind of floating back and forth between each other. But uh, there you have it. To make things even more complicated, because <laughs> we're delving in deep. In some cases, uh, these Curates and Corbantes, who were, of course, obviously associated with the, these spirits known as Idean Dactyles, um, are, are connected uh, with uh, those who protected Leto, the goddess Leto, uh, from Hera as uh, she gave birth to Artemis and Apollo at the city of Ephesus, performing the very same protective task as the idea and dactyles did on Crete in regards to Zeus. Uh, in fact, there was a certain group of priests uh, of Artemis of the Ephesians who will become known as the Curates and will be responsible for reenacting the role of these guardian spirits every year in the Ortigia Gardens, where it was said that Leto had given birth to the twins, uh, according to the Ephesian tradition. Again, in relation to the city of Ephesus, Clement of Alexandria directly connects the Idean dactyles with the invention of what is called the Ephesian letters, uh, believed to be one of the most powerful uh, magical word combinations throughout the entire Mediterranean during the time of antiquity, and inclusive of uh, such words as demimanios, demimanios, which also, just by the way, happens to be one of the personal names 
of one of the idean dactyles. So not only was it supposedly invented by the idean dactyles, but one of the names that are proclaimed uh, in this series of, of, of letters happens to be Domenius, which of course is one of those particular spirits. Now, clearly the idea of dactyles play an important role in the religious beliefs of both Western Asia Minor and into the Aegean. The question that must be asked is what exactly were their origins and how do they relate to these two separate sacred mountains? Also to the goddess Rhea and Artemis of the Ephesians, or to the Curates and the Corybantes, and finally, to the magical tradition of the Ephesian letters. <laughs> so we are in for uh, a riddle, enigma into the mystery. The possible answers that we will tread upon will basically make us explore the more shadowy regions of the religious world, of the late Bronze Age, 1550 to 1200 BCE, and on to the early Iron Age, uh, 1200 to 1000 BCE, along with a mixture of cultures inclusive of the Minoans, the Luvians, and the Mycenaeans. So this is one way uh, that we can uh, explore this earlier uh, substratum of religious belief. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, this is going to be uh, a kind of talk that that uh, we have to keep track of all the different parts. Uh, unfortunately, I, I said this before with another talk. Uh, it's like IKEA, you know, you have the pieces all in different places, and you have to put it all together, <laughs> eventually, piece by piece. So the first piece I want to start off with uh, is the Curities or also known as the Idean Dactyles. So you're going to get used to the fact that the Idean Dactyles are sometimes called Curities, and sometimes they're called Corybantes. And sometimes they are understood as being completely separate. This is the beauty of Greek mythology, <laughs> is that you're going to have uh, differences uh, that comes about. Uh, Ali says, I hope everybody brought their notepads. Yes, because <laughs> we're going to need it. For this talk. Now, Mount Ida uh, and the caves, so we're, we're starting with a Mount Ida that's on Crete. Okay, we'll start there. So Mount Ida and the caves within it were, of course, a sacred to Zeus, especially in connection to his uh, birth by Rhea as she fled from her husband, Kronos, having tricked him by switching uh, a Zeus with a uh, swaddling stone. So let's go there and start to explore. So we're just taking this little by little. Now, the birth of Zeus in relation to Mount Ida on Crete typically involves um, four components uh, in the various stories. There's four components uh, about the birth of Zeus on Mount Ida on Crete. First, there is the goddess having Zeus often identified as Rhea uh, later on. Number two, second, there are those who guard Zeus, often called the Curities or the Idean Dactyles. Third, there are the nymphs taking care of Zeus. Okay, so uh, so so again, second, number number two, remember those who guard Zeus and number three, those who are taking care of, of, of Zeus, nursing him, uh, giving him milk and honey and so forth. Finally, uh, the fourth part is there is the she-goat by the name of Almathea uh, who, that provides direct sustenance for the baby Zeus. So, this, so most of the stories, not most, but a large portion of the stories have these four components. So where does the story start? How does it first begin? Well, the earliest reference to the birth of Zeus that we have does not specifically mention Mount Ida. It, it, it arises from the 6th century BCE. Uh, it's, it's fragment 654, and it says the Curities. Interesting, it does use the word Curities. Uh, hid, it says, the holy babe of the goddess. It doesn't say Rhea, but of the goddess in a cave 
without the knowledge of crooked witness Cronus, when now blessed Rhea stole him and won great honors from the immortals. Okay, so that's the first reference. Uh, once again, note the uh, this is the first uh, mentions the curities first rather than the dactyles in this context. Then in the um, the fifth century uh, BC. The Greek tragic poet by the name of, of course, you know, common comedy as well, uh, Euripides refers to this birth of Zeus in his Bacchae. Uh, and the location is now firmly mentioned to be on Crete, uh, with the protection understood as both being the Curities, and already they mentioned the second, the Corybantes. So you got Curities and Corybantes, uh, who are the protectors. And they use these terms interchangeably. Also, there is a reference to the Phrygian flutes. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I'm going to make a little commentary here. It says, again, this takes place on Crete. It says, O secret chamber, the Curities knew, O holy cavern in the Cretan glade where Zeus was cradled, where for our delight, the triple crested Corybantes drew tight the round drum skin till its wild beat made rapturous rhythm to the breathing sweetness of Phrygian flutes. Then divine Rhea found the drum could give her Bacchic airs of completeness. That's beautiful. I love it. Okay. Uh, so you see this reference already with the, the frame drum, right, of, of the, the Phrygians. But what I find is interesting is, is you already have this interesting connection already here established. And it must have go, and it, it will, we'll see as we go back further. It must have gone back way further on between Phrygia, which is in Asia Minor, Turkey today, and Crete. Because remember, this birth is happening in Crete, and yet they're mentioning already Phrygian influence. So there is already this connection, as I mentioned before, uh, the Mount Ida on Crete. Obviously, there's a Mount Ida in Phrygia, and which borders the Troat. So there is a connection right there. Okay, the next connection uh, in Callimachus, uh, he lived between 310 to 305 to 240 BCE. Uh, I know short lifespans, right? Uh, it is him to Zeus. Uh, he uh, writes as follows. Uh, uh, he talks about the fact, uh, well, he talks about the fact that the nymphs of Arcadia um, carry the infant Zeus to Mount Ida, where they hand the child to his protectors and nurse in Crete. And he says, when the nymph carry the old father Zeus towards Knossos. Interesting. But the old Zeus the companions of the Corybantes took to their arms, even the Dictatian Mille. Uh, Dictatian Mille means honey nymphs. And Adrestia laid thee to rest in a cradle of gold, and thou didst suck the rich teat of the she goat Almathea, and there to eat the sweet honeycomb. And lustily round thee danced the, Cur the Curates a war dance, beating their armor, that Kronos might hear with his ears the din of the shield, but not thy infant noise. All right. So, already now, Callimachus, we see here a large portion of the components I just mentioned are already mentioned here, right? So, he relates the same story uh, that was said earlier, uh, but he talks about, obviously, the Curities here are referred to as the companions of the Corybantes. And he talks about the nymphi, which are these, these honey nymphs uh, and these honey nymphs. Now, it, what, what I find is interesting is, is that um, the ancients believed that the honey of bees were connected to the ambrosial foods that rained down from heaven. They believe that in a sense, honey is connected to that the realm of the divine, it's almost uh, akin to uh, the concept of manna, right? You know, falling from heaven. In this case, it's honey by way of these bees. So bees are looked at 
with so much holiness, uh, just, just as a reference here. So, so we move on here. Um, uh, uh, we will continue that, um, uh, where was I here? Oh, first, for, also for Callimachus, the curities of R. Adrastia, as well as Ida's brothers. Now, these curities are shown as performing uh, this war dance, uh, beating their armor. Uh, we know uh, that as early as Thalatus in his fragment 10 uh, from the 7th century BCE, uh, who was a, 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 who connected to Pindar, uh, that the Curities are accredited to inventing this particular kind of, of war dance. So the dance, they're dancing, in, or he says the dance in armor was first invented and danced by the Curities. Uh, so basically in layman's tongue, <laughs> you got Kronos, you know, he got a raw deal, you know, he thought he's going to kill Zeus. He got a stone instead. And what happens is that, uh, you know, Rhea gives birth uh, to Zeus under under the, the Mount uh, Ida. And in order to, and, and, and of course, shelter him in, the, in a cave, and in order to distract uh, Kronos from detecting or knowing that all this is going on and the baby crying and so forth, they're just having these curities go around and making all this noise, uh, you know, beating their shields uh, with their swords and other things and doing this really loud dance. It's like distraction, distraction, distraction. You, you know, you're not going to hear uh, Zeus, nothing happening here. Move along. But also, uh, they are looked at as protective spirits. They're looked at as protecting him uh, in a magical sense as well, which we'll go into. Interesting, right? So, um, and of course, then you're going to have these these honey nymphs that are going to be feeding uh, Zeus. Uh, and of course, I mentioned these honey nymphs, the Dictatian Mili. Uh, by the way, their father is known as Melissus, uh, uh, the honey man. And so Zeus now feeds upon the honeycomb. Now, you see that one of the names of the nymphs here appears as Adrastia. Uh, but we will learn later on, Adrastia will also be looked at as a goddess. So, I mean, nymphs are goddesses anyway. But but some some cases, uh, what we'll see is Adrastia, uh, is, by looking at the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, is basically being demoted. Uh, Adrastia is a great goddess. And then she becomes more of a of a nymph, and then a honey nymph. So she's on her way, uh, becoming less and less uh, powerful as time goes on, within some contexts. All right. So we move here to oh, and now we go to Apollonius Rhodius, third uh, century BC, and he adds a little fun little detail. He says, uh, in the days when he ruled the Titans in Olympus, and Zeus was still a child tending to the Cretan cave by the Curates of Ida. He talks about the fact that uh, uh, Aphrodite uh, gives Zeus a toy. Apparently, Zeus is getting kind of bored uh, in this cave uh, on, the, on the crest of Mount Ida, and he wants to have maybe just a little bit of, of entertainment. And so uh, Aphrodite addresses her son, Eros, he says, uh, she says to, to Eros, he said, will you be good and do me a favor? I'm going to, I'm going to ask of you. Um, then I will give you one of Zeus's lovely toys. Okay. The one that his fond nurse, Adrastia, made for him in the Idean cave where he was still a child and liked to play. So let's learn about what this toy was like. It describes, it was a perfect ball. It says, Hephaestus himself could not make you a better toy. It is made of golden hoops laced together all the way around with double stitching, but the seams are hidden by a winding blue band. When you throw it up, it will leave a fiery trail uh, like a meteor in the sky. So it's kind of a, so Zeus is, is given a cool toy uh, that will then be given uh, to uh, uh, little Eros, the, the son of Aphrodite. And so basically it just is, kind of beautiful looking ball that you throw and it's like a uh, yeah it's it's like a meteor uh, so there you have that so what will happen now is that the cave of Ida will then take on 
uh, astrological significance, uh, as noted by Eratus uh, in his poem from the third century BCE. And this cave will be connected uh, to the, the nurses or the nymphs that are connected to taking care of Zeus. And what will happen is as follows. Uh, I'll read it. He says, the two bears, which are the constellations of Ursa Major and Minor, wheel together, he says. Therefore, they are also called the wains. Now, they ever hold their heads each toward the flank of the other and are borne along, always shoulder-wise, turning alternate on their shoulder. If indeed the tale be true from Crete, they, by the will of mighty Zeus, entered up into heaven. For when in olden days he played as a child, this is Zeus, in fragrant Dicton, or Mount Dicta, near the hills of Ida, they set him in a cave and nurtured him for a space of a year. What time the Dictali Curates, right, the Curates right here, were deceiving Cronus. Now the one men uh, by the name of Crassonius and the other Hilke, uh, so they mentioned them their names. What will happen is that you have now these, these two uh, that are, are taking care of, 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 of Zeus. Later on, those names will be changed uh, to the nymph Adrastia uh, and a nymph that takes on the name Ida. Ida, which is the same as the mount. I know to me confusing. I know, right? So you got you got Ida the nymph and you got Ida the mount. Obviously, she's named after that. So uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, so what happens now is Diodorus Siculus in the first century BCE, he writes as follows about Mount Ida. Uh, he says, he said, the Curates, who had received Zeus from Mother Rhea and had nurtured him in the mountain of Ida in Crete. He says, we are told that the Curates, when Rhea, the mother of Zeus, entrusted him to the unbeknownst to Kronos, his father, they took him under their care and saw to his nurture. The myth of the Cretans relate, uh, relate runs like this. When the Curates were young men, the Titans, as they are called, were still living. These Titans had their dwelling in the land about Knossos. Now, now we're having an interesting situation. Now we're having... This reference again uh, to this, this Minoan city that becomes a Mycenaean city and to the age of the Titans. As we know uh, by studying uh, ancient history, the Titans are oftentimes connected with the Minoan layer of gods and goddesses. And then when you move over to the Olympians, they connect to the Mycenaeans, the ones that come after that. So... So the ancients are telling us, as we're going through this, that there's an earlier meaning, there's an earlier connection uh, to these uh, uh, to these figures and to the curity. So where do we go from here? Well, here we jump into it. So ready? Okay, so the, the, the looks like the whole legend is fully formed by this point. Uh, Diodorus Siculus, uh, he, he writes in the first century BCE, he says as follows. He said, when Rhea had given birth to Zeus, concealed him in Ida, as it is called, and without the knowledge of Cronus, entrusted the rearing of him to the Curates of Mount Ida, the Curates bore him off to a certain cave where they gave him over to the nymphs, Ida, and Adrastia, with the command that they should minister to his every need. And the Nymphi nurtured the child on a mixture of honey and milk and gave him upbringing at the udder of the goat, which was named Amathea. And many evidences of the birth and upbringing of this god remain to this day on the island, he says. For instance, he says, when he was being carried away, when still an infant, by the Curates, they say that the umbilical cord fell from him near the river known as Triton in Crete, and that this spot has been made sacred and has been called the Ophelis after that incident, while in like manner the plain about it uh, is known as Ophelia. And on Mount Ida, I'm still reading the, the source, where the god was nurtured, both the cave in which he spent his days uh, has been made sacred to him, and the meadow about it, 
which lie upon the ridges of the mountain, having in like manner been consecrated to him. But he most astonishingly of all that which the myth relates has to do with bees. I'm still reading bees. And we should all admit to mention it. The gods, they say, wishing to preserve an immortal memorial of his close association with the bees, changed the color of them, making it like copper with a gleam of gold. And since the region lay at the very great altitude where fierce winds blow about and heavy snows fell, he made the bees insensible to such things and unaffected by them, since they must range over most wintry stretches. Okay, so this is a very full quote. Uh, it, it, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked here. But what I want to say here, first of all, uh, is that is that you have now already established during the time of Diodorus Siculus in the first century BCE, uh, all of these sacred spots, all these sacred locations that are around Mount Ida that we know from archaeology that people are visiting. They are making pilgrimages here connected to Zeus and hoping that the magic of the spot will give them special abilities. We're going to go there. Don't worry. We're kind of building to it. Uh, so there you have it. Now, also, uh, you have this notion that bees uh, suddenly uh, get much of, of what they are from, uh, from uh, the story connected to Mount Ida, that the bees... Uh, that are you know are connected to the holy honey right uh that they are turned copper a gold color uh because they're they are considered sacred vessels and furthermore that uh they're able to survive in high altitudes without being very very much affected so so you have this notion of the holy bee according to ancients starting at Mount Ida. And I think, I wish we would take better care of the bee today, right? For Because already at this point, uh, they are considered sacred. I mean, after all, I mean, Zeus is, is weaned, uh, you know, obviously fed upon that. Okay, and remember, uh, I like honey personally. It does taste like ambrosia, doesn't it? Right? Sweet to the taste. Well, we're not done yet. Then there's this other reference, he continues, that goes the next step. He says, they, the Cretans who settle in Sicily, built a temple to the mothers and accorded these goddesses unusual honors, adoring their temple with many votive offerings. The cult of these goddesses, so men say, they move from their home in Crete, since the Cretans also hold these goddesses in special honor. The account which the myth preserves of the mothers, runs thus, he says. They nurtured Zeus of old without the knowledge of his father Kronos, in return for which Zeus translated them into the heavens and designated them as a constellation, which he named the bears, which is Ursa Major and, and Minor. So you have that. Now he continues. Uh, he says, and Eratus agrees with this account, this is him writing, when he states in his poem on the stars, turn backwards, then upon their shoulders are the two bears. If true, it will be they from Crete into the heavens mounted by the will of mighty Zeus, for that when he was a babe in fragrant Dicton near the, the Idean deck uh, mount, they set him in a cave and nurtured him for a year while the Curides uh, dicti uh, uh, practice the seat on Kronos and so forth. So, so you have this direct connection. You're going, whoa! So now you have these these mothers, who uh, sorry these uh, sorry these mothers, and I find it interesting. So you have this these two goddesses. Now you're going, okay. So what are you doing with this? Okay. So wait a second, because we got to really unpack this. There we go. Okay. So these nymphs then are mothers who are goddesses, and they are two of them, got it? One of them being Adrastia, the other being Ida. And even though some sources call them nymphs, other sources call them goddesses. Now, if we go further back into Cretan history, further back 
to the time of the Mycenaeans, it turns out that they have this, this dual goddess. It means there's a two, two different goddesses, right? And uh, it turns out that uh, Adrastia is connected uh, in an earlier sense to, 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 to Rhea and connected to Demeter. The other one, uh, we go further back, is connected to Kor and to Persephone. And so we have in linear B tablets references uh, to those who are called the two queens who will become Demeter and Persephone. Oh, you just saw what I just did there, right? So what we're watching here is at first you have earlier on the Minoan period of time, you have this powerful goddess and you have also uh, this other goddess that's connected with her, these two, and that will be understood as Demeter and Kor or Demeter and Persephone or Rhea, right? Or uh, the great goddess or Kibli. And what will happen is, is that they will slowly transition. And by the time you get to the Roman times, certain traditions have them just as nymphs. Meanwhile, uh, Rhea herself as the identity is split off from Demeter and becomes separate and becomes the wife of Kronos. We just went there. Uh, and a lot of uh, ancient scholars know this, but can you see this de-evolution of thought? Yes. And once again, what was the key to turn that thought studying the curities or the idea in dactyles? Okay, so, so Zeus was protected and nursed uh, uh, for a year, specifically by the mothers. And so uh, more they're more than really simply <laughs> honey nymphs, right? Again, again, these are were once uh, powerful deities, uh, and they are in the stars, you know. And you you probably can figure out that long before uh, when they looked at Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, when when they looked at the skies, they thought to themselves, they weren't thinking of these just these honey nymphs in the stars. I'm sure the Minoans and the Mycenaeans saw these as two goddesses in the sky. I I'm sorry, I I find that interesting. Now, according to Strabo, um, in his geography for the first century BCE, the first century CE, the Curities were more identification of the Curities, who were, again, also known as Idean dactyles, right? So remember, water number one done, used interchangeably. Uh, he says, is this about the Curities? These are young men who executed movements in armor accompanied by dancing as they set forth the mythical story of the birth of Zeus. And this is Strabo saying, in this they introduced Kronos as he accustomed to swallow his children immediately after their birth and Rhea as trying to keep her travel secret. And when the child was born to get it out, of the way and save its life by every means in her power. And to accompany this, it is said that she took as helpers the Curities, who by surrounding the goddess with tambourines and similar noisy instruments and with war dance and uproar, were supposed to strike terror into Kronos and without his knowledge to steal his child away. So, you know, I guess these curities are the power to scare away this old titan, he continues. And that, according to the tradition, Zeus was actually reared by them with the same diligence. Consequently, the curities either became being young, that is, youth, they performed the service, or, or because they reared Zeus in his youth, for both explanations are given, he says, uh, according to Appalachian. So you're thinking, okay, so wait, is there... It sounds like a lot of the same information, but it's not because did you catch it? According to Strabo, it says that the Curities, young men who execute movements in armor, it says set forth the mythical story of the birth of Zeus. So you, this is in response to the idea that there are people that are calling themselves Curities who are doing 
this myth for people to see as a pageant, as a story. Got it? So you have the real spiritual curities, Idean Dactyles, Cory Montes, right? But you also have these young men uh, who are going to perform these mysteries and tell the story. Why this is important is, is while this is done for Zeus, we know for a absolute fact this happens with a call to Artemis of the Ephesians with another group of priests also called Curities doing their pageant and of the mysteries at the Ortega Gardens uh, showing Leto giving birth to Artemis and Apollo and they the Curities making all this noise and frightened away in this case of course uh, uh, Zeus <laughs> you guys got it so more and more nugget and the question is so where are they performing these mysteries most likely again Mount Ida so you're going to have performers there doing this kind of thing cool huh okay uh, moving right along, Strava also notes in the Cretan accounts, the Curities are called the rearers of Zeus or protectors of Zeus, having been summoned from Phrygia to Crete by Rhea. So Strabo now makes a connection. While we have earlier, right, the reference to the, the Phrygian flutes and so forth, there seems to be a connection with, uh, with Phrygia in Asia Minor with Crete. Well, here, Strabo goes direct. He goes very direct, and he says, no, no, no. Uh, he says, some say, uh, once again, that uh, having been summoned by Phrygia, from Phrygia to Crete by Rhea. So it is, they're, they're from now. Now they're from Cre uh, uh, Phrygia, excuse me. He continues, some say that of the nine uh, uh, Telknines who lived in Rhodes, those who accompanied Rhea to Crete, and reared Zeus in his youth were also named Curities, little additional aspects. So now, according to Ovid, see how we're unpacking so much as we go, as we go along in the first century BC, first century CE, he says as follows, Ovid, he says, why the great goddess Rhea loves incessant din. Why does she love incessant din? Do you like incessant din? I don't know. When Jove or Zeus was born, to Rhea, a stone concealed in cloth settled in the god's gullet so that the father was fated to be tricked. Here you go. For a long time, steep Ida booms its clanging noise so the wordless infant may wail safely. Shields or empty helmets are pounded with sticks, the curities or Corabante's task, the truth hid. The ancient events copy today her acolytes shake brass and rubbling hides they hammer cymbals not helmets and drums not shields the flute makes phrygian tunes as before once again ovid refers to these mysteries being reenacted at ida they're being reenacted and demonstrated again now uh, in the Ovid story, Almathea is not the she-goat, uh, but actually a naiad who owns the she-goat that gave Zeus his milk poured into his mouth via her broken horn. So there's a few other additional uh, details uh, that are there. Uh, of course, uh, Virgil talks more about the honey, uh, the importance of the honey, uh, the holy honey from Ida. So that's kind of interesting. But let's move on. Okay, so where we go from here uh, is that, um, oh, okay, well, I guess we have to go. We'll have to kind of keep going, but we're, we'll keep unpacking. According to Pseudo Apollodorus from the first and second century CE, he uh, says as follows, Rhea, when she was heavy with Zeus, went off to Crete and gave birth to him there in a cave on Mount Dicte, in the cave of both the Curities and the Nephi Adrastia, and the daughters of Melissa, the honeyman. These Nephi nursed the baby with the milk of Almathea, he says. Uh, he also talks about the fact that uh, uh, he mentions uh, pseudo apologists rather than the name of the mountain. Ida is here described as one of those taking care of Zeus. So you have this transition over that Ida is not simply a mountain, but it is one of the nymphs. And that's why that's brought up. Uh, pseudo Hygienus 
uh, uh, from the second century, it's interesting what he, what what uh, he does uh, is a, is, a, is another twist that you won't expect. Okay, he starts off he who well, he calls Rhea not Rhea he calls Rhea Opus or Upus or Upus, which is a name connected with the Magna Mitre. It's also connected with Kimberly, and also it's one of the sacred names of Artemis of the Ephesians. He uses that name instead of Rhea. So there's a more of a tie-in going on here. He says, after Upus had born Zeus or Job by Saturn or Kronos, uh, Juno or Hera asked her to give him to her since Saturn and cast Orcus under Tartarus. Now you're going, wait, 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 Hera? I'll, I'll keep reading. When he realized what he had done, he started to hunt uh, for Job throughout the earth. Juno or Hera, however, took Job or Zeus to the island of Crete and Almathea, the child's nurse, hung him in a cradle from a tree so that he could be found neither in heaven nor on earth nor in the sea. And lest the cries of the baby be heard, she summoned the youths and gave them small brazen shields and spears and bade them go around the tree making noise. In Greek, they are called curities. Other call them corbantes. Th these in Italy, however, call them lairs. Now, what's strange about this, and it is strange, uh, Doctor Rito, uh, it wasn't isn't is, is, is Hera is that the the sister of, 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 of Zeus? Yeah, I guess she's born and she survived apparently, and she's the one who brings him to Crete. I know it's a very strange story. <laughs> it, you know, it makes a mess out of things. And, and furthermore, and then he's put into this cradle that's between uh, the heavens and the earth. And he just kind of hangs there in between. So you can see the struggle when it comes to going through these ancient legends. Um, uh, we, we talked about the fact that these nurses uh, who are these nurses can be nymphs. Uh, these nurses who take care of Zeus can be goddesses. They can be mothers. Uh, they could be Ida, Ida and Adrestia. They could be Helike and Sensora. They could be Ethmo and Nida. The long point of the matter is, is that these stories are very fluid. Very fluid uh, indeed. Okay. So where do we go from here? Okay, so you kind of get the idea. So. In summary of this whole section, of the four characters or groups about the infant Zeus, we have, dis we have, dis we have discerned that, first of all, the, li the literary uh, sources are concerned, Rhea is the most prominent name for this goddess, but a few, which I didn't read because I didn't have time, sometimes the goddess is instead called Adrastia, and sometimes called Upis, and sometimes called Kibli. Second, as for the curities or the idea of dactyles, they are defined as special protectors of Zeus. They're the one banging their shields to distract Kronos from detecting the crying of baby uh, Zeus. But the but the curities are also known as idean dactyles, and they're sometimes used interchangeably as corabantes, but they seem to be in most cases connected uh, to the Mount Ida's, especially, of course, on this case, Mount Ida and Crete. Number three, as for the nymphs. As for the nymphs, sometimes these nymphs are, you know, are Dracia or Ida. Sometimes there's other names. All we know is we have nurses who are nymphs who take care of Zeus. And finally, fourth, we have Amathea, who's a she-goat. But sometimes uh, uh, it is the father uh, who of the, of the uh, who takes care of the she-goats. So you have these various legends and stories. Now we're moving to the point of, well, let's take a look at this Mount Ida. So we're going to go to the first image of Mount Ida. So go ahead, um, um, Margie. Let's take a look at Mount Ida a little bit. What light can investigators via archaeology and epigraphy bear upon illuminating the stories circulating about Mount Ida? Uh, here, of course, we must uh, dive into ancient understandings of sacred mountains in general. Of, of course, uh, central to the importance of sacred mountains in the beginning is the key is the idea of animism that there exists a spirit in all things. 
whether within a river, a tree, a rock, an animal, and yes, even a mountain. It was a given that there existed a spirit within each mountain that needed to be respected. In fact, it required it, especially if you were set upon crossing over it during a journey or making a pilgrimage to the very top. In many ways, uh, how much the earlier animism survives within a particular region will determine how much the actual physical object of the mountain in and of itself is recognized as being filled with an animated spirit in some kind. Mount Ida absolutely is viewed as having such kind of spirituality. Because of their prominence topographically, mountains become connected to regional identities with the belief that each mountain represented the group of people living at its base. Eventually, many mountains were not only viewed as actually embodying the spirit, but became more specified, uh, given gaining a, sp a, a special name and understood to actually be a god or a goddess. And we're going to see this in a little bit. Curiously, uh, uh, humans tend to gravitate to mountains with unusual features, to elevated places that have, how do you say it, personality. So the morphology of the mountain uh, is very important. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, mountains will be viewed as a sacred center for power. In many cases, they are viewed as the oxymundi or the axis of the world, uh, seen as a place from which the world began. And you're going to see this with Mount Ida in a few moments, right? Because the sacred mountain uh, connected to the place of life above and the place of death below. Often sacred mountains are understood as places of life and death occupying the liminal place in between. So you have this mountains were believed to connect not only with the sky, but yes, the underworld as well. So both Mount Ida's. Next picture. Oh, no, I just want the, the, the other Mount Ida, sorry. Because uh, I, I had three pictures of Mount Ida. Yeah. So both Mount Ida's were believed uh, to be sacred highways between both realms the realm of the sky above and the realm of the earth below. So now, so let's go into the archaeology. So here we go. So we're going to go uh, to, the, to the next slide. We're going to talk about, let's take a look at the so-called cave where Zeus was born. Uh, I'm sorry, Margie. Uh, it's it's the first cave picture. So uh, it is known as the Idan Cave. Uh, it is 40 meters long, 50 meters wide. It's um, uh, 1,540 meters above sea level. It was first excavated in 1885, uh, most recently 1982. People came to the cave, this particular cave, to seek help from Zeus. Uh, next next uh, picture. We'll go to the next one because it's so small. Yeah, okay. Pythagoras described an altar carved into the natural rock in honor of the god of vegetation. Later on, it will be replaced by Zeus. Now, the altar is at the cave entrance, and you can see that it is partly still there, right? Uh, Theophrastus uh, mentioned the fact that worshippers, when they arrived at this cave, hung offerings of a poplar at the entrance. Uh, there was once a large ivory throne in honor of Zeus located here, but it's now lost. Uh, they found many different kinds of artifacts. Uh, a double axe was found here, uh, bronze figurines, beautiful uh, rings and brooches, bronze statuettes, seal stones. Tools, other metal objects, gold, jewelry, ivory pieces. And we also, they found a bronze shield. Let's take a look at the bronze shield. Next slide. This bronze shield, take a look at this. This is Zeus. And do you see what he is between? <laughs> That's right. Those two winged, helmeted men. You know, uh, one, of course, connected uh, holding a lion, uh, you know, another uh, connected to the sacred bull of Crete. Those are curities. Those are Idean dactyles. Yes, we actually have an image that has survived 
of them and look they are winged right they have those beards and they are winged they do uh look like interesting uh sprites uh it, hard to tell but there's some human heads that are in the center maybe connected to sacrifice uh, if you look closely uh that right there of course is zeus in in the middle uh showing off uh quite a bit and it's on a shield remember when it talks about these curities it talks about them banging against a shield well hey how great is that uh here is a shield that you could see uh that that, that is the evidence that was actually located at the, the cave okay next picture uh this is some of the other kinds of little pieces that we we found in the cave the seals and so forth okay the next picture uh, here's, look at this shield, right? So we found a lot of shields uh, in this cave of Zeus. You can make out uh, the next one. That's a great, that's a, that's a better picture. Looks like a cat, doesn't it, right? Okay, next picture. There is another cave where all the tourists want to go to. And uh, just like anything in antiquity, you're going to have competition and they mentioned of course you have the, the cave uh which we we just talked about the idean cave the idean andron right on, on on crete by mount ida well there was a there was there was competition there was another cave that people claim no it it wasn't that cave it's this cave uh i of course uh more historically, you know, the other is more traditional, but this one is was was very sacred to the Minoans. And you know what? I'll be honest. This one looks a lot more impressive. Uh, it's mentioned by Hesiod. Uh, the Hesiod mentions the fact that Zeus was born here. Uh, we know from excavations that it was a sacred cave uh, for the Minoans. Uh, go to the next picture. It was excavated first in 1886. Uh, the famous Hogarth uh, excavated in 1900. And what they found on uh, the next picture, uh, they found a, a stuccoed altar uh, in the upper cave. Uh, and they went down, they found a strata of ashes where there was pottery pieces and votive objects, bronze, terracottas, iron, bone. They found 30 libation tables. They found uh, conical ceramic cups. And for food offerings, they found bones. So we know that they offered here uh, bones of bulls and sheep, uh, goats and deer, uh, even a boar. We found a whole bunch of Minoan and Mycenaean pottery. We found double axes. And we also found various uh, male and female statuettes. Uh, go to the next picture. There is a, there's a double axe there that they found in the cave. Okay, let's go to the next one. That's too small. Let's go to the next one. Some little things that we find out in the cave. Uh, the next one's very important. Hopefully it shows up. There we go. Okay, so what we see here, we, they found here is um, an image of the goddess. You can see there's a very close relation to the sun uh, and to the sun's journey, as well as to the idea of the movement and time in these particular pieces. Uh, we see uh, the symbols of mountains with the rising sun. We see the rising sun connected in in a uh, uh, sea, uh, connected to the double axe. Do you see the double axe there? We see also, we see the horns of consecration uh, underneath it. We see bull plants and oxes or bull and birds and various symbols connected to the cycle of life. So we know that this site, uh, this particular site, was sacred to Minoan goddesses. And later on, Zeus takes over. Zeus is worshipped here. But, and of course, like I said, it's a problem because you're not sure which site uh, is, uh, is, is the supposed legendary site. 
you know, back in ancient times, there was there there was a situation of where when you make a pilgrimage, I guess you know you're going to go uh, to the one on on the on the side of Mount Ida, or are you going to go to the Dicte one? And you know what? It looks like the pilgrims decided maybe we'll just go to both <laughs> and be safe. Uh, thank you, Margie, for showing those particular pictures. That's great. All right, so that kind of gives a little bit of imagery here. Okay, so let's talk about Adrastia a little bit. Adrastia uh, means, uh, the word means inescapable. And other than being uh, later on understood as the offspring of either Oceanus or, or Melissus, right? You know, the, the bee man. Uh, according to one story, she was specifically instructed by the goddess Rhea to nurture Zeus in the Dictatanian cave or the cave or the Ida cave. Now, we've seen both, and the story goes, you know, it could be either one. It depends on your primary source. Uh, she was worshipped by the name as a goddess in Phrygia, uh, and there's evidence of that even, even into the Hellenistic era. But her name, this is important, in Asia Minor, it's the big moment now, is used interchangeably with the name Kibli. And we know that Kibli was also associated uh, in Phrygia as a goddess of childbirth, too. So Adrastia, uh, you know, who gets to be, sometimes she's this nymph, sometimes, you know, she's a, uh, you know, she's a, one of the, the, the honey nymphs, sometimes she's a, a goddess. Uh, when you get into Asia Minor, into Phrygia, uh, she's understood as being interchangeable with, with Kibli. So she's very important. So it looks like her importance gets less as it gets uh, further to the West. Although with that said, sometimes the names Adrastia and Rhea are used as one. So now we have another complication. Adrastia is sometimes called Rhea. So I guess Rhea can't send herself to do it. And again, you have this earlier stratum. Conversely, the name Adrastia is used also, they also use the name uh, Anunk who is the daughter of Rhea. So Anank uh, means force, constraint, necessity, and is depicted with a spindle and, a, and is understood as a primordial uh, deity. So Adrastia is then, therefore, who weaves creation. Kind of reminds me of the indigenous myths of a, of a weaver. Adrastia is also associated with Nemesis. So uh, we're going to go to the next picture. So uh, we're going to see some pictures of Adrastia. Oh, we didn't get to that one. That's one of the bronze seals from the uh, from the sacrificial stratum. Uh, yeah. So, yes. Okay. So uh, you see Kimberly on the left. On the right, some will say that this is Rhea. Other pe people will say this is Adrastia. So you got to you get an idea of what she may look like. Go to the next one. And this is her, Adrastia, uh, in the form of Nemesis. Now, look again, we have wings, do we not? So these, many of these are, they look like angels, do they not? They're winged deities. I want to tell you that in ancient Mycenaean, in Linear B, the name Adrastia is there. Uh, we see this as a da re -ti -ya. Ate Retia, which is Adresta. And Adresta, uh, in some of the stories, is the one who gives Zeus that toy. Uh, so there you have that. Okay, so um, I'm not sure what the next picture is. Go to the next picture. It may not be related. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we go on, of course. Now, this is Demeter. So we're moving on to the next deity. So we talked about Adrastia. So we know that Adrastia uh, can be uh, Rhea. Uh, she can be Nemesis. Uh, she can be Kibbele. And we've established that she goes all the way back to the Mycenaean period and earlier uh, as one who just kind of weaves everything together. What about Ida? Because Ida, remember, is a mountain but Ida also becomes known as a goddess or a nymph, right? 
Uh, so what will happen is Ida will be connected to the goddess Demeter. So here is Demeter here, as shown. Okay, so as for Ida, she was both a goddess and a mountain. According to Diodorus Siculus, Ida was the mother of the ten purities, those who worship the goddess Rhea in song and dance. In some traditions, uh, you know, so you have that. So in this one tradition that, that is mentioned by Diodorus Siculus, right, Ida is both a goddess and a mountain, and she's the one who is the mother of the ten purities who are sometimes understood as Idean dactyles. Now, in Minoan Linear A, the name most likely referred uh, to a mountain, but of course it would be a sacred location, and so likely a mother goddess was also referred to. We find three inscriptions uh, uh, connected to Ida. Uh, one is uh, at Archilochroi, and the other is at Kathira. And what we do here is we take a look at the word Ida. And we take a look at the word da. And da is a derivation of the, the word ge. So da and ge. And ge is connected to Gaia. So da or ge means, means earth. And what will happen is that you have Ida Mater. Ida Mater. Mater means mother. So Ida Mater or Da Mater means earth mother, which means Demeter. Next picture, just nice close up of, of Demeter. That's a good one. So what I'm trying to tell you is Mount Ida is also connected to the great goddess Demeter. And has the, it's the same derivation uh, in ancient Greek. Now we can go through all this. I can, I can go ahead and, and talk about, you know, that we only have, you know, 1,400 Minoan inscribed clay tablet fragments. And of, of linear A, revealing 78 hieroglyphic signs, forming 1,025 words. The 15 of these hieroglyph signs and 45 can be read because they have Luvian counterparts. We could talk about that. But uh, what we can tell you also that these words will then translate over uh, into Mycenaean uh, and so linear B. And then, of course, there will be also accompanying Demeter. There will be also Potnea or the mistress. Or, and, of course, we have these other connections. And again, uh, Demeter is also connected to uh, Kibbele. Uh, okay, you can close this one for right now. Meanwhile, uh, what will happen here is you have Poseidon. Okay, you have Poseidon. Now, I think I already just told you quite a bit. Oh, I want to show a little bit more. Uh, I want to go through. I just want to show you some Minoan art, just so you get a chance to see uh, this great goddess of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. So I'm sorry, uh, Margie, if you go back for a second. Uh, let's take a look at some of these. Okay, so this is... Uh, Potnia, this is the mistress connected to Persephone. This is a little bit later. Let's go to the next one. There we go, a little bit earlier. Okay, go, 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 go next. All right. So this is the great uh, mother goddess that could be attributed to being Demeter. Uh, it could be attributed to being connected uh, to Rhea. Uh, it could be uh, later on, of course, uh, Kibbele as well. And you, you will see note there, you got the sun, you got the moon, you got the double axe going on there. Uh, you got uh, flowers, right? You see these blooms there. It looks like there's a connection to fertility. Look at the tree behind, uh, uh, full of looks like maybe uh, grapes, right? So she is a goddess of plenitude. 
Uh, she is the Earth Mother. She is the she is the Ida, which which is of course uh, uh, means means Earth Mater Mother. And there it is. Uh, next one. But you're going to see also that from this seal uh, from the Minoans is that she's connected to ecstatic religion. That Mount Ida, which we'll go into on Crete, as well uh, as in Anatolia, is connected to ecstatic religion. And it goes pretty early on. I mean, look, you have, you know, you know, this could be a priestess or this could be the goddess, but it looks like they're having quite a good time. Next one. Uh, there's another seal, right? I'll give my seal approval. Okay, next one. Look at this, you know, and you can see right here, uh, the mountain peak is considered sacred, and there's a there's a temple enclosure on top, and you can see a city below. These seals are amazing. I wish I could go on forever. Uh, next one. Uh, if you want the details there, you can take a screenshot of that. Uh, it gives you more uh, description of what is going on. So the Minoan goddess was quite prominent. It, it, so what we're kind of doing is we're studying how this great goddess, who is understood as Demeter. Now, I, I do want to say this, that Demeter is an Indo-European word. It is, and Minoan or Linear A is not an Indo-European Indo language. And so many people will say the word Demeter was borrowed from the Luvians or somebody else who are Indo-Europeans, and they made it their own appellation. They made it their, their own their own name for their goddess. But But of course... What was another name of their goddess, Eletheia, right? Uh, could be that could be one of the original names, which is not Indo-European, uh, and it, its root is Minoan. So, but still, Demeter uh, is connected to this earlier goddess, right? And this and directly connected to Mount Ida. Mount Ida. This is the this is Mount Mother. And now we're going even further because. You have this idea we're worshiping the goddess of the mountain, right? The great mountain mother. And you're going to have this actual phrase being used in Asia Minor in dedication to the great mountain mother, who is not only just a great goddess, but she's also known as Kimberly. All these connections, all these names for just the same goddesses. Wow. I'll go to the next one. Okay, so we'll, we'll close, we'll close, wait, wait, uh, you'll close there for real quick, and then we're going to start in to the other. All right, so you can see that this is, this is a mystical, mythical, magical mountain, and it's known for its uh, uh, energy, its spirit. So as a result of that, uh, who was drawn to this mountain? His name was Pythagoras, Pythagoras, 570-494. Uh, you know, he came, he believed that this place was filled with this sacred wisdom. And uh, he visited this shadowy figure who comes from Mount Ida, Pythagoras, and his name is Epimenides. Epimenides. Um, the story goes, according to Laertes, Pythagoras, while in Crete, he went down into the cave of Ida with Epimenides. Now, Epimenides is a semi-legendary, if not mythological figure. I mean, he did exist, but we don't know much about him. He's almost in this liminal place between history and, and fiction. And he lived uh, in the 6th century. Uh, he was, uh, Epimenides was a combination. He was a, he was a seer. He was a shaman. He's a philosopher. Uh, he was a poet. Legend has it that Epimenides was tending his father's sheep. And then he entered the sacred cave, the one that you just saw of Zeus, at the Mount of Ida on, on Crete. He fell asleep, and he woke up like Rip Van Winkle 57 years later. And he was filled with magical powers, including the gift of prophecy. This is what you give get for sleeping in the cave of Zeus. I told you they believed that this cave was imbued with all these magical powers. Many Greeks believe that Epimenides was not only involved in the Orphic Mysteries, but was one of the founders of it. 
the famous Orphic Mysteries. And again, where is that source? Yes, Mount Ida. All of a sudden, you're going, wow, I, Ida had no idea. Okay, sorry. Plutarch uh, tells how Epimenides purified Athens after its ritual pollution. Uh, um, and uh, they, uh, they were negotiating with the Persians, you know. So he came along and uh, he kind of, he cleaned up Athens. So uh, Promenides did it first. That's true, Allie, right? Uh, according uh, to Plutarch, uh, uh, he was reputed to be a man beloved of the gods and endowed with a mythical and heaven-sent wisdom in religious matters. Therefore, the men of his time said he was the son of a nymph named Balte and called him the new Cures. And of course, coming to Athens, he made friends with Solon and uh, he got them more serious about, once again, he's a son of a nymph and connected to Ida. Ida, which is connected to, of course, all of these nymphs. Now, Epimenides, uh, uh, you know, they liked him in Athens. Uh, apparently, the Spartans didn't like him, and they they killed him because he wouldn't do anything for them as their prisoner. But uh, when they, when Pausanias writes that after Epimenides died, they actually found his skin was covered with tattoos, which is interesting because. Um, the Greeks really regulated tattoos in their belief system, which tells you that Epimenides may have been a part of a tradition that was quite different. Now you're thinking, well, I never heard of Epimenides, but now you have. And it's like, well, guess what? Epimenides <laughs> is quoted in the Bible. Wait, wait, what? what? Wait, quoted in the Bible? No. Yeah. Who quotes Epimenides, the Apostle Paul, on Mars Hill in Athens? He says to the Greeks that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far away from every one of us. And then he quotes, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Epimenides is quoted. He's quoted again. Wait, he gets quoted again in the Bible? Yeah, he gets quoted in the book of Titus. Uh, it says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. <laughs> well, you should know he, he's from that region. How are we doing? So Epimenides, so you're having uh, so you can see that this place is filled with power and all these legends and all these stories. Let's move over to the other site, Mount Ida in the Troad. So, uh, Margie, we're going to go ahead and take it away. We're going to see some pictures of Ida. There's Mount Ida in the Troad. Um, you're, I, I know you're seeing that green space there. And it looks pretty cultivated. It's it's upset quite a few people because uh, they discovered that this mountain is full of gold. I'm serious, gold. And they are. Uh, and there was a, this whole this. They, they had this back in 2019. Uh, they had uh, this court case, like you know, you're destroying the natural environment. Uh, but it looks like the developers are having their way because there's gold in those hills. Uh, this Mount Ida uh, is uh, is uh, 1,770 meters or 5,820 feet. It's only 20 miles from ancient Troy. Uh, go to the next picture. Uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, it, there's thermal springs that surround it. Uh, the next picture. And uh, you have, of course, uh, sacred springs everywhere. Next picture. I know. Uh, there's the mountain peak itself. Yeah, Rich's Corace, as somebody, Ali says. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Next one. You also have what's called the Altar of Zeus at uh, Adetepe. Uh, uh, supposedly, here's where Zeus watched the Trojan War. Uh, it, it goes back pretty far. There's a staircase with steps carved into the rock. There's altar niches. There's seat platforms. There's a cistern, which is room-sized. 
Uh, it's it's pretty pretty fancy, right? So this is Mount Ida. Uh, thank you uh, for showing those, uh, Margie. Now, Mount Ida in Asia Minor was connected to the great mother, Adrastia, because here, Adrastia counts, you know, uh, and who in turn is closely related to the goddess Rhea, as well as the Phrygian Kibli, right? Now, the uppermost peak of Mount Ida is actually mentioned in the Iliad, uh, uh, called the Gargarus. We also know from the Iliad that this mountain was sacred to Zeus. Uh, it was from Mount Ida in Anatolia that Zeus abducted Ganymede, right? Mount Ida also makes his appearance uh, in the famous Roman epic, uh, the Aeneid, described as a shooting star fallen upon the mountain as a sign by Jupiter that he answered a case's prayer. So that runs into this. Now, of special interest, uh, one mythological event happened here uh, in what's called the Cypria, and that's the famous beauty a contest. Yeah. So it's called uh, the Judgment of Paris. Remember this, right? You know, when Eris, the goddess of discord, uh, is upset because she was not invited to the to the wedding, right? She throws this apple, this golden apple uh, that says uh, to the, the fairest one. And uh, the goddesses start to fight amongst themselves, right? You know, Hera, the wife of Zeus, and Athena, the goddess of wisdom, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, because they all claim, well, to the fairest, it must be one of us. But the contest was set upon Mount Ida with the three goddesses appearing uh, before uh, um, uh, Paris, who is one of the sons of King Priam, who had, by the way, 50 sons. That's a lot of sons. And he was to decide which one was the fairest of all. And of course, all these goddesses gave special inducements, you know. <laughs> you know, Hera's like, hey, I'll make you, make you a great king, you know. And, you know, and, and Athena's like, I'll make you a great warrior. And, and of course, Aphrodite says, hey, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to give you the most beautiful woman. <sighs> in the world and of course he goes he goes he's a you aphrodite is the, are the most beautiful of all of course there's a catch because the most beautiful woman of all happens to be married <laughs> menelaus and so there i have it okay so but this is the center uh mount ida uh to mystical traditions especially the dionysian ecstasies as well as the kibbly ecstasies and this was a center uh, for uh, those known as the Gali. Uh, what are the Gali? Well, these are the eunuch priests of the Phrygian goddess Kibli. Uh, they perform dances and uh, uh, they uh, play the tambourines and uh, pipes and they, they flog themselves and uh, they, were, they wore women's clothes, uh, usually yellow. They wore turbans, uh, pendants, earrings, heavy makeup. And they beg for money sometimes, uh, but they castrated themselves uh, on the Day of Blood, which is on March 24th. And they became uh, a, a woman. Uh, and so what is interesting here is that this site, this site was the center of that activity. This particular Mount uh, Ida. And it connected to Adresta, who is also understood as Kibbley. And so what I'm going to do is, yeah, I'm going to go over time because there's a lot of, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I want to go ahead and read uh, one of the stories that poems that takes place here connected to one of the Gali. Uh, it's from the first century BCE. The Latin poet Catalyst uh, is the one uh, who talks about it. Uh, and, um, after, of course, the act of self-castration, as a result of devotion to Kibbele, uh, this 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 uh, this devotee, of course, goes to Mount Ida, and so let's go ahead, Amarji. Let's show another picture. Next one. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh yeah, sorry. That's that's Zeus's throne. I'm sorry. That's Zeus's throne. Uh, that's Zeus's throne. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so as I read this, we'll take a look at this one here. This is right here. This is a Gali. So this is a convert uh, changing through castration 
uh, into a woman. So here we go. It goes as follows. Catalyst says, carried in a fast ship. This is, of course, this is the golly herself saying the story. Okay? So she's telling the story. Carried in a fast ship over profound seas. Attis, eager and hurried. That's the name of that person. Eager and hurried. Reached the Phrygian grove. The goddesses' dark places. Crowned with woodland. So you can already see that uh, she has arrived at the Phrygian Grove, which is at the bows of Mount Ada. And uh, these are, it, it was, it was pretty thickly wooded. It still is a little bit today. And there, exalted by amorous rage, his mind gone. It says, it says, he cut off his testicles with a sharp flint. Next sentence, she then, aware of her limbs without the man, while the ground was still spotted with fresh blood, quickly took in her snowy hands a tambourine, such as serves your initiates, kibbly, instead of a trumpet, and shaking the hollow half-hide with delicate fingers, quivering, she began to sing to the troops this. Go together, wandering herd of the Lady of Dynamis, quick into exile, you look for a foreign places, and following me, and the rule I had adopted, you bore with the salt tide and the violence of the high sea, and emasculating your bodies with too much hatred of Venus. Delight the lady's mind with your errant haste. Overcome your reluctance together. Go to the Phrygian shrine of Kibli, to her groves where the voice of cymbals sound, the tambourines rattle, where the uh, Phrygian piper sings with a deeper curved pipe, where maenades wearing ivory throws back their heads, where they practice the sacred rites with sharp yells, where they flutter around the goddess's cohort. It is there we must go with our rapid dances. As this, uh, the woman sang this to her companions, the choir howled suddenly with tumultuous tongues, the tambourines, the, the cymbals clashed again, and the swoop troops moved off to Ida with hurrying feet. And it goes, a crazy panting, drifting at her last gasp. Addis with a tambourine leads them through opaque groves like an unbroken heifer refuses the yoke. So you get a really good, good a description of what Mount Ida was like with these dark and thick groves. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It still is today. When they reached Kibbele Shrine, there used to be a shrine that was there. By the way, we're still looking for that shrine. Uh, maybe when they're looking for all this gold, they're going to come across it. When they reach Kibbele Shrine, feeble and worn from too much toil, they take their rest without bread. Sleep covers their eyes with heavy blanket. Their rapid madness subsides to a girlish quiet. But then the golden sun with the streaming eyes purifies. And so it keeps going on. But you have Mount Ida referenced quite a bit. In fact, it says at one point, shall I live above the snow line on Green Ida? Shall I pass my life under the rocky peaks of Phrygia? And so, yes, it, what happens, though, is that then she is driven mad uh, into the forest. So, yeah, uh, uh, Mount Ida uh, is very important. Uh, let's go to the next picture briefly. There's another picture uh, of uh, one of these. There it is. Uh, one of the golly. There he goes. Okay. So let's okay. So let's let's close this up here. Okay. So um, now Diodorus Siculus likewise mentions the connection of the Idean dactyles with Mount Ida in Phrygia, and sees them as wizards. He states as following. So we're kind of. I won't go. I'll go a little bit longer. I want to make sure I cover this. I want to get to Ephesus real quick, but. The first of these gods, native to Crete, of whom tradition has left a record, made their home in Crete about Mount Ida, and were called the Dactyli Idoli, or an idea of Dactyles. These, according to one tradition, were 100 in number, but another say that there were only 10 to receive this name, corresponding in number to the fingers of the hands. But some historians, and that Forrest is one of them, records that 
the Datali Idai were in fact born on Mount Ida, which is in Phrygia. I'm still reading this ancient source. So I love when ancient sources, uh, these ancient writers are fighting amongst themselves about where the origins arrive from. So are born on Mount Ida, which in Phrygia, and pass over to Europe together with Mygon, since they were wizards. They're wizards, Harry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, and they practiced charms and initiatory rites and mysteries. And in the course of a sojourn in Samothrace, they amazed the natives of that island not a little by their skill in such matters. It was at this time, we are further told, that Orpheus, who was endowed with an exceptional gift of poetry and song, also became a pupil of theirs. So now the claim is the idea of that tiles from Mount Ida uh, in Phrygia and the Troad, you know, in Asia Minor, uh, are the ones who, told, to, who taught Orpheus his mysteries. And of course, the Orphic rites. And it continues, who was endowed with an exceptional gift of poetry and song, also became a, a pupil of theirs, and was subsequently the first to introduce initiatory rites and mysteries to the Greeks. So you suddenly realize that this talk is really important. You suddenly realize that these ideas, what nobody wants to talk about, are the source of so many of the major ideas amongst the ancient Greeks, you know, these stories and religions and beliefs. Okay. However, this may be the uh, Dactyli Idli of Crete, so tradition tells us, discovered the use of fire and the nature of metal, copper, and iron, as well as means of working them, this being done in the territory of the city of Aptera, as it was called. Oh, and it keeps, keeps going. And writers tell us that one of them was named Hercules. And excelling as he did in fame, he's the one who established, I continue reading the source, who established the Olympic Games. And that the man of later period thought because the name was the same, that it was the son of Alcmene, the Hercules of the Twelve Labors. But they're saying, no, it wasn't. It was one of these Idean dactyles. Uh, many women, even to this day, take their incantations from this god and make amulets in his name on the grounds that he was a wizard and practice the arts of initiatory rites, uh, but they add things that were indeed far removed from the habits of, of Hercules. And so, so, so basically you have already now magic is being connected uh, to these Idean dactyles. They are workers of magic. Uh, moving on, um, there's more I could say. Um, uh, you know, um, actually we just, we kind of covered that one of the, the who's connected to uh, the creation uh, who discovered iron, uh, according uh, to the Homerica, is known as Demanius. Demanius uh, is one of the Idean dactyles, uh, but he is also the first one mentioned by name, uh, and he is also connected with the discovery of iron. Uh, the first reference uh, goes back to the 8th century BCE, but it mentions the fact that he discovered iron on Cyprus, this idea in Dactyle, in the Homerica. And then later on, uh, it moves it to Crete. So there's kind of a kind of a, a traveling idea. So, so the iron is first smelted. Well, that makes sense. Remember, the idea in Dactyles are connected to the, the fringe around the edge, the lower part of the mountain, and these caves. And of course, obviously, you're going to have various metals and alloys in connection uh, to that. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip sections here. I just want to mention the fact that um, um, I'll give you a summary of what I'm skipping here. The Corabantes are also known as, as mystical uh, kinds of characters, and uh, they're sometimes used interchangeably uh, for the word uh curities as well as id and dactyles they just kind of mix them all up and sometimes they're completely separate it depends but the corabantes are also directly connected to the uh, god by the name of dionysus and it turns out that 
one of the centers of Dionysian worship in Phrygia turns out to be the, the drum roll. Yes, Mount Ida as again. So here you have this mystical mountain uh, connected to Kibli and the Nagali, but also to the frenzies, frenzic aspects, uh, rituals of Dionysus. And in fact, uh, uh, here there is a story which I won't talk about, talked about by Nonis where Rhea and Dionysus get together uh, at Ida with the Curities and they organize the war against India. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I got about uh, one, two, three, four pages of that. The Curities are also uh, worshipped, Idian Dactyls dash Curities, known interchangeably, are also worshipped all the way through Greece. I'll just mention a few of the names of the places. Uh, Brase, uh, Messenia, Olympia, Elis, Megapolis, uh, Maskelis, uh, Eubia, and of course, obviously on Crete. Uh, the, the dactyles, also known as Curities interchangeably, are worshipped throughout Mysia uh, as well as, as Phrygia. Uh, they are also uh, worshipped uh, 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 throughout the Troad, throughout Phrygia, uh, at Piscinius. You know, yes, <laughs> and Ali says, uh, yeah, uh, India didn't stand a chance uh, with a Dionysian wine. No, I would, wouldn't think think so. So let's move. Now, the idea of dactyles, here we go, going to the next next level, because we have to get here. Diodorus Siculus uh, says that uh, after the idea of dactyles, he says, according to the accounts we have, he says there were nine curities. So again, he uses the words interchangeably. Some writers of myths relate that these gods were born of Gaia, the earth. And that would make sense. Gaia, the earth, right? Remember? Ga, da, Demeter. You see where these stories are coming from now? You're going to become a classicist pretty soon. To others, they were descended uh, from the Idean dactyles. Okay, so... Once again, the Curities uh, are either, um, uh, you know, connected to the idea of dactyles um, or descendants of Earth. Their home they made in a mountainous place, which was thickly wooded in full ravines, and which, in a word, provided a natural shelter and coverage, since it, since it had not yet been discovered how to build houses. And since the Curities excelled in wisdom, they discovered many things which are of use to men generally. So, for instance, they were the first to gather sheep and flocks. Whoa. So the Curities are the first to domesticate sheep. Uh, they were the first to domesticate several other kinds of animals which men fattened. And to discover the making of, of honey. There's another honey connection. And we're kind of understanding how honey is, is very much part of the Ida connection, right? In some manner, they introduced the art of shooting with the bow and the ways of hunting animals. And they showed mankind how to live and associate together in common life. And they were the originators of concord, so to speak, of orderly behavior. The Curities also invented swords and helmets and the war dance by men by means of which they raised a great alarm and deceived Kronos. And we are told that when Rhea, the mother, we heard the story before, right? Diodorus said that the nine curities came after the idea and dactyles, but that instead of 10 of them, there were nine. So there's some differences in opinion here. Also, uh, he says in some myths, they were descended from out of the earth. So some myth that the Curities are descended uh, out from the earth, while in other stories they were directly descended from the Idean dactyles. So you have, once again, the Curities are sometimes, here we go, uh, uh, door number one, the Curities are coming from the earth. Door number two, uh, the, the Idean dactyles gave birth to the Curities. Door number three, the Idean dactyles are the Curities. Welcome to Greek mythology. <laughs> oh, oh, oh man. Okay. Oh, just okay. So let's uh, since we since I, I want to be a little down to earth, 
on this one. I'm getting silly. I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. We we already heard the other two. So let's go, let's get let's get the down to earth story. Uh, where are the curities come from? Uh, this is found in Hesiod's Theogony. Uh, so he talks about this. He says, "Then the son Cronos, from his ambush, stretched forth his left hand, and in his right took the great long sickle with jagged teeth, and swiftly lopped off his own father's <clears throat> members." <laughs> and cast them away to fall behind him. And not vainly did they fall from his hand, for all the bloody drops that gushed forth, Gaia received. So earth received this blood. And as the seasons moved round, she bare the strong Aranes, which are their furies, and the great gigantus, the giants with gleaming uh, armor, uh, and uh, the Curities, and the Nymphi, who they called Milai, probably uh, fitting that the nurses and protectors of the infant Zeus were born from the blood of the castration of Uranus, for the god was destined to avenge their father by disposing and imprisoning Cronus. So here you have this idea of the descent. There are other sources as well. Um, 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 and of course, um, I have them all here, but we don't, we just don't have time. Okay. So, oh, there's another great, these are such great great sources but i just got to keep going okay so let's move to the ephesian context so i'm going to be moving through lots of pages here and i know you're thinking to yourself boy dr reedfeld this sounds like a book it is a book it's a book that i haven't written yet uh and it's a book that does not exist yet uh so there you have it i will say this you know um here it is, is that uh, the um, the origin of the name Curities. Strabo talks about the origin of the name Curities. He says, but since also the historians, because of the identity of the name Curities, have classed together that they are unlike, neither should I shrink from discussing them. He says, for instance, they say that the Curities, a tribe of Aetolia, got this name because like girls kore they wore women's clothes for they add there was a fashion of this kind amongst the greeks and the ionians were called the tunic trailing and the soldiers of leonidas were dressing their hair when they were to go forth in battle so the persians it is said conceived a contempt for them though in battle they marveled at them Speaking generally, the art of caring for the hair consists both in its nurture and in the way it's cut. Both are given special attention by girls and youth. I don't know. He's going on a, on a, on a here. So that there are several ways in which it is easily to derive an etymology of the word. It is reasonable to suppose also that the war dance was first introduced by persons who were trained in this particular way in the matter of hair and dress. These being called curities, and that this dance afforded a pretext of those who also were more warlike than the rest and spent their life under arms, so they too may be called by the same name. What I find is really interesting here is you have this war dance, and there's this assertion that's made by Strabo that at first they had long hair and they're wearing robes. It may not come as a surprise that in the Ephesian legends, uh, they won't have them as curities uh, when it comes to the frenzy dances uh, uh, at the side of the Artemisian. Ortigia, they do, but Artemisian, they don't. They have them as Amazons. Amazons. So the Amazons are ones make doing all the dancing with the hair, and they are women. And so many scholars are thinking maybe they're women to begin with, uh, women who are going through uh, these kinds of, of motions to ward away. Wow, I, we went there, didn't we? Isn't that great? Let's go a little bit for uh, their dances. Now, these curities dances, according to Strabo, are very, <clears throat> the word, orgastic. Very orgastic. Uh, we use that word too often. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you hear Strabo himself concerning these rites of the curities. Uh, he says, uh, he says, now, this is a common both to the Greeks and the barbarians to perform these sacred rites in connection with the relaxation of a festival. These rites being performed sometimes 
with religious frenzy, sometimes without it, sometimes with music, sometimes not, and sometimes in secret, sometimes openly. And it is in accordance with the dictates of nature that this should be, be so. For in the first place, the relaxation draws the mind away from human occupations and turns the real mind towards that which is divine. And secondly, the religious frenzy seems to afford a kind of divine inspiration and to be very like that of a soothsayer. And thirdly, that secrecy with which the sacred rites are concealed induces reverence for the divine since it imitates the nature of the divine, which is to avoid being perceived by our human senses. And fourthly, music, which includes dancing as well as rhythm and melody uh, at, the, at the same time by the delights it affords by its artistic beauty, brings us to a touch of the divine. And this is for the following reason. He goes on there. So you have this mystical, these orgastic rites that are, are done uh, you know, by the curities. So it's much more than just a war dance uh, beating the metal, so to speak. Uh, they're all over the place. And you can see very quickly, there is a connection to the orgastic rites of yes, right? The initiates of Dionysus, the maynades, who also have the same rites. And where do they all circle about? So much as in Phrygia, mystical Phrygia around the Troad. And what's the heartbeat of that? Mount Ida. Wow, I mean, this is, yeah, and of course, obviously, I can go on to the dances, uh, but uh, there we have it. Oh, there's just so much here, and the flutes and so forth, uh, the orgies, we'll skip that. Uh, and uh, serious, <laughs> I'm going through this so fast. Okay, so Ephesus, there's a connection here. Uh, of course, there's a, there's a connection. Strabo says his geography on the same coast of Ephesus is also Ortigia, the sacred Ortigia Gardens. Here is the mythical scene of the birth. Uh, Leto gave birth to Apollo and Artemis here. Above the grove lies Mount Salamisus, where it is said that the Curates stationed themselves with the din of their arms to frighten Hera out of her wits when she was jealously spying on Leto, and when they helped Leto to conceal from Hera the birth of her children, that being, okay. Uh, a general festival is held there annually, and by a certain custom, the youths vie for honor, particularly in the splendor of their banquets there. At the same time, also, a special college of the Curities hold symposiums and perform certain mystic sacrifices. So you have now... Those curities that I talked about around Mount Ida, well, the Ephesians, they go, well, you know, we, we you know, uh, not only do those curities uh, help ward away uh, angry uh, and confused Kronos uh, from the birth of, of, of Zeus, but we have our own curities that frightened away Zeus himself. From the from Leto giving birth to Artemis and Apollo at the sacred Ortigia Gardens. And so you have this, and they called their own priests who were involved in these mysteries, they called them curities. Whoa, okay. So so um then as I'm skipping, then the curities. Also, the idea and dactyles are connected uh, to the legendary Ephesian grammata or Ephesian letters, which are considered the most magical words in the ancient Mediterranean. And so we're going to go there. This will be the last part of this talk. I know it's pretty long, but it's a lot of great information, isn't it? Okay, so um, besides, okay, so the Ephesian letters, uh, which is, of course, uh, I know them by heart. They're aske, kataske, lix, tetrex, temenios, ta usia, right? So, this is the, so besides, uh, there is, of course, fourth century evidence ascribing the grammata to the city of Ephesus. We have lots of sources that say the Ephesian letters are connected to the city of Ephesus. But there are other issues that must be addressed, namely the belief that these letters, these sacred letters, were invented 
and used by the legendary Idean dactyles. So Clement of Alexandria writes in the second century, he says, some more fabulously say that a certain of those called Idean dactyles were the first wise men to whom are attributed the invention of what are called the Ephesian letters and of numbers and music, for which reason dactyles in music received their name. And the Idean dactyles were Phrygians, Phrygians, and barbarians. Okay, so now they're giving these Idean dactyles dash purities uh, the credit for coming up with everything, right? There was a hymn from uh, Eritrea uh, from the fourth century BCE that addressed the Idean dactyles, and one of them is named Demanios which of course uh, is one of the personalities that are referenced in these famous sequences known as the Ephesian letters. Uh, the, the German uh, uh, scholar Ben Hemberg has established that of all the various myths regarding the idea of dactyles, those referring to Demanius were the earliest. Here he is closely grouped with another figure known as Akmon, and both were thought as magicians and metal workers. Uh, indeed, uh, Demenius is also mentioned in what's called the Pharaonus Epic, the earliest source we possess even on the dactyles. By the way, Pharaonus uh, is the primordial king of, of, the, of Argos. He's also known as the bringer, fire bringer, uh, the lawgiver. And in fact, he is the one who introduced the idea of fire in the forge, which is connected to metal making. So it's interesting, this source goes back to the 8th century BCE, and Demenios is mentioned here uh, as, as well. Naturally, um, um, uh, what will happen here, uh, here is naturally the names of the Adean Dactyles, inclusive of Demenios, along with Kelmus and Akmon, were used within their own magical cycle. And Plutarch, himself in the second century remarks on this custom first and second he says true it is those who have got by heart the names of the idean dactyles use them as charms against terrors repeat each name with calm assurance but it is also true that the thought and recollection of good men almost instantly comes to mind and gives support to those who are making progress towards virtue and every onset of the emotions and all difficulties keep them upright and saves them from falling. So once again, uh, Plutarch at first talks about the fact that these Idean dactyle names are used in magic uh, as charms against terror. So Demenios's name is used against fear. Uh, so once again, they're, remember, they're the ones who scared the Idean dactyles are the ones who scared Kronos away, right? And the Idean dactyles, you know, when they're understood as curities, <coughs> they scare away Zeus away. <laughs> they keep the men away, don't they? <laughs> so there you go. Uh, arm yourself with these uh, these names, right? Now, uh, as mentioned before, now the Ephesian grammata word the Manios was invoked frequently within the Greek magical texts. The Manios is often translated as subduing. Uh, the work can also be translated as overpowering. Uh, sometimes it really does not make sense to convey into English a word that was supposed to be mysterious, however. It may come from the Greek uh, uh, verb, the mazo, which can mean to overpower. Uh, in fact, the form of this word uh, to overpower uh, is used in the Gospel of Mark in the context of the story describing how a demon could not be subdued or tamed. <laughs> That's Mark 5, 4. But anyway, so Demanios is, is, is understood then uh, as an idea in dactyle, but also understood as a power word. Maybe at first uh, it was just an utterance that had no sense whatsoever. But later on, the Greeks saw, hey, the etymology is this, and it means overpowering. Who knows, right? One interesting spell uh, using the word Demanios in the Greek magical papyrus was established, uh, which was, was to establish a relationship with Helios, the god of the sun. This spell was designed to provide the person 
whatever they wish. You can see where these demonios, as part of the Ephesian letter sequence, aske, kataske, lix, tetrax, demonos, uh, you can see how this word already uh, is connected uh, to giving you whatever you need. It's like the, the ultimate abracadabra. Uh, I'll continue. This spell um, begins by invoking the four winds of the world, followed by an invocation during each of the 12 hours of the sunlight in order to secure this relationship with Helios, first invoking uh, a, a, a theromorphic animal totem governing that hour, followed by each particular hour's sacred tree, stone, air, and land animal, and finally the name of the spirit demon in charge. This is pretty interesting. That Manios is declared to be the demon uh, or daemon ruling the fourth hour of the day uh, in connection with the animal totem Taurus or the bull, the amethyst or opal stone, the turtle dove for the air, the bull for the earth, and the sacred tree having given way to dust and so unknown. So we, we lost that part of the manuscript. <laughs> so we don't know what the sacred tree is. So a charm intended to give foreknowledge and memory. Uh-huh invokes the name Demenios uh, uh, in, in three different forms. So, uh, and it's specifically connected to Artemis and Selene, the goddess of the moon, and observes the lunar instead of the solar month. Following the first day of the lunar month, the particular, the practitioner was instructed to declare a series of magical words seven times to secure the spell in each of the successive days up through the 15th. And you're thinking, you know, oh, the name Demenios appears uh, as well as the name Artemis. You're thinking, well, you're reading this. I know. Guess where I'm reading this from? My book. <laughs> I published this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. It's like, he seems to be reading this. Oh, yeah. I wrote this in my book, Artemis of the Ephesians. So I'm just quoting it. I don't know if there's also love charm intended for attraction. Are you seeing where so Demenios is, is very important? So in multifaceted aspects, um, you have, of course, uh, um, Demanios was evoked um, also in Jewish magic. According to one Greek magical papyri, the name Demanios was to be evoked along with a very long list of other gods, spirits, demons, as well as Saboth, Adonai, Aliim, and even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> include Demanios in that. Of course, uh, we could talk about the full meaning of the Ephesian letters, but I will just say that uh, the, the very strong belief is that the Idean dactyles uh, uh, in each antiquity were the ones who, who came up with it. And the Manios being the most powerful, one of the most powerful of the sequence of words. But to talk about the Ephesian letters, of course, would be a whole nother lecture. So it brings us back to Mount Ida. As it turns out, these, as my papers are blowing everywhere, because I have it on the fan here, these two magical mountains, both Ida identical, <laughs> oh no, um, uh, both connect to this earlier sub uh, sub level of ancient goddesses. But not just simply ancient goddesses, but mother goddesses that are connected to fertility, but also connected to ritualistic ecstasy as well. So it, this goes into, uh, these are mystical centers. Uh, these are sacred places where even when you go there, in many ways, it is believed that that sacred power will come upon you. I mean, hello, that you know, uh, but many is he. What does he do? He falls asleep in the cave and wakes up with magical powers. So, uh, this is what people believed uh, in many ways. So you have Mount Ida, two mountains connected together with ancient goddesses of Minoan and Mycenaean being brought into. Uh, the Greek and Roman period of time, and it connected to that. Of course, you're going to have uh, this idea that this there is that not only do you have these goddesses in connection to these mountains, you have these range of spirits 
Now, I want to go one step further because I am so tempted because you can see I'm holding back certain things. So I'm going to take a big glass of water and I'll tell you something more. Ready for the mystery? Here it is. The IDM dactyles, the curities, connect to an earlier level, an animistic level of nature spirits. And these are the nature spirits that survive into the Greco-Roman era. These are the early elementals, the early spirits, these early sprites and so forth. A time where they saw a spirit in all kinds of things and mountains and trees and lakes and, uh, and springs. And somehow this tradition survived. And then, of course, you have the rise of, of various goddesses, of, of deities, right? And uh, and in this mix, still, these Idean dactyles survive. And because they're believed to be so early, all these ancients uh, credited them with, with inventing everything. Because they must have been there because they're so early. And they're obviously before the Olympians. They obviously come from the time of the Titans or even beforehand. So one thing we can be sure of is that the Greeks and Romans believe that these Idean dactyles, curities, corribates, uh, are exceedingly ancient. And that brings us to one further mystery and step. One which I haven't had a full time to develop because I have more pages. But I'll say this. The more we study the idea and dactyles, the more we study the curities, the more we will be, uh, be able to understand not only the ancient Minoans and Mycenaeans and the Luvians, but we'll be, under, we'll be able to understand more distinctly about the ancient religions of Anatolia. Uh, before any kinds of records, because there's enough hints here and there where we can start to piece it together. It is indeed a mystery, but it's a mystery worth pursuing. Thank you so much.